Rachel, I don't think this is working. No? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight, appreciate it. I hope none of you had to deal with bad roads. Um, before we begin, uh, first of all, I'm Stephen Pognani, I'm head of marketing here at the Institute of Science. Welcome tonight. I wanted to cover a few upcoming events we're doing here before we begin. Uh, Saturday, you can meet Mo the Sloth. He'll be making a visit to the Bat Zone, uh, I'm actually to the Bat Exhibition in a special appearance. Um, we're auctioning off bat houses made from the set of Batman the Movie starting uh, March 11th. These are going to be available via eBay. Uh, when they were making the film, part of which was filmed right up the road in Pontiac, they came to us and said, what can we do to help save the bats? And they came up with the idea to make bat houses, so there's about 100 of them. So uh, go to the Organization for Bat Conservation's website and preview them. They're really spectacular, so it's exciting. And then our Maple Festival is March 13th, Sunday. Uh, it's going to be 55 degrees, so there will be no snow this year, obviously, but it will be a great day to be out walking, and we've got a lot of the typical traditional events. It's going to be exciting. And then on the 20th, we're doing Superhero Sunday, where you're supposed to dress as your favorite superhero. doesn't matter how old you are. And come to the Institute where we're going to do superhero-themed activities, um, nature activities, etc. The week of April 4 through 8, we're doing the Rites of Spring all week, where we'll teach everyone how to be better environmental stewards through activities and uh, nature-related activities. And then on the 14th of April, we are doing CIS After Dark, which if you haven't been, it's a very fun event for adults 21 and up only. Thursday night, it's um, food, it's music, it's beverages, it's activities. It's a chance for adults to have a night at the museum, so it's really worth doing. And then of course, our next lecture here is April 7th. It's um, Dar Dar Darwin Schultz, who will be talking about f um, managing nature through fire, the use of burns. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Patrick Doran back to the Institute of Science. Dr. Doran started with the Michigan chapter of the Nature Conservancy in 2005 as the Director of Science and moved to his current position in 2012 where he oversees a staff of more than 30 conservation professionals. He leads statewide and Great Lakes-wide investigations of conservation priorities. This includes the identification and prioritization of important conservation areas, as well as the development and implementation of conservation strategies and measures of success. Patrick earned his doctorate from Dartmouth College, where he studied the causes and consequences of spatial variation in the distribution and abundance of forest breeding songbirds at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. He received dual master's degrees in ecology and environmental science from Indiana University, where he studied the effects of forest fragmentation on the breeding success of forest-dependent songbirds. And finally, he received his undergraduate education at Villanova University. Patrick has also held positions as a habitat biologist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and as a senior ecologist, GIS, and an GIS analyst with the Wildlands Project. Thank you, Patrick. That's a great resume. Welcome. Thank you all for, uh, for being here tonight. Um, thank you for choosing me over 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 Donald Trump or anyone else who could have <laughs> you could have gone and seen. <laughs> I I can only hope that I'll be more entertaining than 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 a oh, good. Thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure. This is my my third talk given here at Cranbrook, and it's a wonderful partnership between Cranbrook and the Nature Conservancy, and I very much enjoy this. So thank you for coming. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule, and and I hope we can have fun. Um, I have quite a bit to talk to you about. I'm going to take you on a on a tale of of why conservation should consider working in urban areas and cities. And I want to show you examples from, from across the globe. Um, I'm going to show you an example from Africa and some of our work from cities there. And I'm going to bring it back home to show you some of the work we have here in Detroit. Um, but first, you know, I, I always show this slide. Um, I work with the Nature Conservancy. It's, it's um, the most wonderful place to work. And it's a place I wanted to work since I, I was uh, in, in college. Um, we have a Michigan mission to Michigan mission, a mission to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Um, and we envision a world where the diversity of life thrives and people act to conserve nature for its own sake and for its ability to fill the needs and enrich our lives. Um, 
Many of you uh, know the Nature Conservancy well, and many of you probably know the Nature Conservancy for hopefully years and decades. Um, and, and you may think of us as a conservation organization that has some wonderful preserves that works in places. Um, we have always been a science-based organization, and that never changes. We're six years old. But what has changed over those 60 years is the scale at which we choose to work. And, and so I want to show this slide. And this is a little bit of ecology. It's a little bit of conservation history and, and the science of conservation. Back in the 50s, when the Nature Conservancy was found, the, the, the science of ecology really focused on the distribution and abundance of plants and animals. And the Nature Conservancy was founded to protect and conserve some of those very endangered plants. And specifically, we were founded by a number of, of plant ecologists. And so back in the 50s, our main strategy was a strategy of protection, purchase land and conserve that land. Um, as we move through time in the 70s, 80s, the field of conservation biology began to think more about landscapes and began to think beyond the boundaries of protected areas and the impacts and threats coming from them. And then the Nature Conservancy adapted to do work at a slightly larger scale. We didn't think just about a preserve. We thought about the context in which that preserve was and some of the external factors which may come into play on the, the health or quality of that reserve. As we moved into the 2000s, the field of, of ecology and the science of ecology really began to think larger about the whole system and, and the whole landscape. And we began then, the Nature Conservancy began to work way beyond the borders of our preserves. We began to think about the role of, of managed lands, the role of agriculture, the role of forestry. In the state of Michigan, approximately 23% of the state is in some type of, of biodiversity protection. That includes our state forests and our national forests and, and strictly protected areas. But that means that 75% of the land is not, right? That's agricultural land uses, it's urban land uses, it's suburban land uses. And it's, so we also realize we have to work in those types of landscapes and with those stakeholders and with those partners to achieve our conservation goals. At the same time, we weren't thinking just about rare species anymore, a plant or an animal. We were thinking about functions and processes. We were thinking about the flow of water and the provisioning of clean water. We were thinking about migratory animals that move thousands and thousands of miles. I don't know if anyone just saw the news of a, of a dragonfly where they just documented the longest migration of an insect. These dragonflies were flying across oceans wow. and, and moving thousands of miles around. It was just hit the news just yesterday. When you begin to think about the conservation of things like that, right, you need to think about the whole landscape, the whole system. We just can't focus on a preserve anymore. Now, while we still do protect some of those very special and very wonderful places, we also have to think about the larger landscape. So we have to think about things like the hydrological cycle, how water flows from the upper parts of our watersheds or our hills or our mountains out to these great lakes. We do have to think about that when you plop a city in the middle of that and how that changes the flow and movement of water because we care about fisheries out here in the Great Lakes. We care about all the wonderful things along our coast. We care about the mussels in those rivers, but we also care about that the city doesn't have negative impacts on those things. But we can also think about how those things provide for those city to build that, that constituency for conservation. This is a database um, my colleagues, my, my, my scientists put together of migratory fish in the Great Lakes. This is almost a half a million data points of migratory fish in the Great Lakes con collected from a couple dozen different resources. When you begin to th think about the conservation of native fish that move from the Great Lakes up into these streams, you have to think about a half a million data points. And pretty much all parts of the Great Lakes are important. We can't just think about one special place. This is another piece of science that just came out in the past month that shows movements of migratory birds throughout the season. And these show these migrants. I want you to move as they move up through the Great Lakes, bam, right in the middle of May. And then you hit June, July, and they turn around and migrate back south, right through that Great Lakes. Some of the greatest cities in the world are there, right? Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. That is so cool. That just came, that's some break, groundbreaking science that just came out. Um, using a great data set from Cornell Lab. will show it again. But when you think about processes like this, about conserving migratory birds, I better be thinking about this whole system. I better be thinking about the cities as they move through them through the Great Lakes. And I can't just think at the high points of the year. I have to think through the summer 
and then back through the fall. Isn't that fascinating? That's like, that was, when that, that made so much news and set, set our social media buzz when that thing came along. That's not our scientists, that was some, some other folks. But we also have to think about people and the way people interact with nature. Um, these are some shots from around the world. These are not Detroit, but how people use the landscape and can we find some solutions in our conservation that promote the health of cities, but also feed back to the health of nature. So let me give you a little bit of background on some, some, some population trends, some global stats, and why we need to think about urban and the pressures that we're seeing and the reasons we need to do conservation in urban areas. This is uh, 2010, this is the percent of urban population in 2010, and this is the projection in 2050. So these are people that are living in urban centers in these countries. A few years ago, I think about half of the United States population used to live, more used to live in, urban, in rural settings, and that flipped over to now more live in urban settings. Just that again. Um, whoops, I want to say, I, I wrote down some stats I want to share with you. I'm, I'm going to go home and visit my folks this weekend. They live in Northeast Ohio. And I was thinking when my dad was born and my mom was born, there were about two billion people in the world. There's seven and a half billion people in the world now. So in that time, my parents have seen well, three and a half more Earths, or two and a half more Earths, a population. That's change. That is an amazing amount of change. Um, my kids have seen, my, I have a son that's, that's 15, my daughter's 12. They have seen another billion people enter the world since their short time. In about 12 to 15 years, another billion people on Earth. So think about that. My dad's time, two billion people, and I think there were about 200 million people in the United States at that time, and that's moved to about seven and a half. That's, that's incredible pressure on our resources, but it's also an increase in the number of people that nature needs to provide for, because all of our food, our fiber, our resources come from nature. This was a paper that came out from some Michigan State University researchers of, uh, back in 2003. But it's not just that population increase, um, it's the behavior that we have. So many years ago, it wasn't uncommon to have six people in a household. Now, we have bigger households with fewer people. So even in countries where populations are not growing, the impact on the landscape is increasing because of our behavior. Larger houses, fewer people living in those houses. Divorce means you need a couple of houses for the same family. Or in the past where you may have had um, parents living with you, six or eight people, you had one refrigerator. Now they don't live with you, that's two refrigerators. So it's not just population growth. Um, and again, as I said, even in places where population is not increasing, the impact in the landscape is increasing because of our behavior. So it's, it's not simply a population growth thing. So more households containing few people are more damaging the environment than simple population growth. And this is some work done by some Nature Conservancy scientists that work for our global program. And this shows the distance from a protected area, the average distance from a protected area to a city. And it shows a change in 1995 to a projected change in 2030. So this means that in Africa, cities are getting 27 kilometers close to protected areas because of their expansion. In the Caribbean, cities and natural areas are getting nine kilometers closer. In North America, 11 kilometers closer. So think about that again, as we increase population, increase our footprint on the landscape, we're starting on a collision course between what we think of as traditionally nature out there and cities over there. They're gonna start flowing within one another and intermixing with one another. So I just want to show all these things. Anybody know where this is? This, yeah, where is this? Anyone seen this statue? This is in downtown Toronto by the Rogers Center. They have a huge pileated or woodpecker column and there's a pileated woodpecker which is about the size of, as tall as this building and they have a yellow-bellied sapsucker on the bottom which is probably bigger than me. It's a really cool um, thing, but, but in, the, in the words to this, it says, this is a specific site history to a swamp where waterlogged and cane trees would have attracted indigenous woodpeckers. You know, are we going to live in a world where we would have attracted? Well, I, I, I don't think so. I get worried about that sometimes, but I think we can find um, some ways to live in a world where we actually can see that coexistence. This is a, this is a woodpecker I, I took a shot of uh, just a, a couple weeks ago as we were on a hike. I live over in Hazlitt near Lake Lansing. Um, we were out on a hike in the woods and saw this wonderful guy up in the tree. Um, 
Now, while I really love this is incredible sculpture and incredible artwork piece, go to Toronto and see it. It's, it's really fun. Um, it's right down by the Rogers Center. Um, and that definitely has value, and that definitely connects people to nature. Um, we still can have these types of things and these types of sites and these types of experiences in nature. So our um, chief scientist, uh, since moved on to another organization, said this in that paper I showed you. He said, um, we can set up all the reserves we want, and we should set up conservation and, and nature preserves in the most wonderful places in the world. But if we do not also take care of where we place our cities, how we grow our cities, and how we live in our cities will fail in our mission to protect biodiversity. That's a pretty powerful statement, right? Where we put those cities, there will be new cities in the world. Um, how we grow them, controlling the growth, or doing that growth by some type of design or with some consideration to nature, and how we utilize resources in those cities. We will fail in our mission to protect biodiversity for some of those reasons I showed you, because we won't be concerned about water quality and the water quality impacts on the species and systems we care. We won't be considerate of large scale migration patterns. We won't understand um, the value of clean water and, and, and quality of water and the amount of water. So while you may have known the Nature Conservancy, this is uh, our very first preserve 60 years ago, Mianus Gorge in, in New York. Um, we will continue that work, but in the next 60 years, we will also have to work in landscapes that look like they do here on, on your right. So that's my, that's, my, that's my hypothesis. That's my introduction. So now I want to kind of go in and show you a couple examples of how conservation is being done in an urban landscape. So um, this is my landscape. I didn't draw this, but I love this diagram because it shows a watershed. Um, got a, we'll call this a great lake at the bottom, a city, and, and the landscape above that. So as we, you know, again, thought about the Nature Conservancy for many, many years, we might have set up preserves on the dunes of Lake Michigan there, which we do have a preserve on the dunes of Lake Michigan. We might have set a preserve and purchased a wonderful bog up in the Upper Peninsula up in, up in the woods, up in the forest up there, which is a very special place. In the past um, few decades, we've also began to work with agriculture because agriculture has impacts on the landscape, mainly on water quality and water quantity. So we've begun to work with agricultural stakeholders. Um, we may work with forested landowners that are actively harvesting trees to work with their forest practices and their policies and try to make them more sustainable to continue the health and the diversity of those trees and the structural diversity and the species diversity of those. In recent years, in the Great Lakes here, the Nature Conservancy has actually worked more in the water. We've done a wonderful reef restoration up in Grand Traverse Bay that I think was a focus of a talk here about a year ago. Um, actually, in the Great Lakes, restoring fish populations. But how do we think about cities? And we've recently launched a program here in Detroit. Um, and as we move along and think about this whole system, we have to think about cities. Because the cities rely upon that top arrow at the top left. They rely upon nature for the health of those cities, the water they're getting, um, the clean air they're receiving. But they also have an impact downstream on the lakes um, and on the rivers. <coughs> So our goal with the Nature Conservancy across the organization globally with cities is to fundamentally change the relationship between nature and cities so that both can thrive. In North America, we have a strong urban program. We're active in about 13 cities, um, actually probably more than that, but 13 officially throughout North America. And there, our main focus is on protecting fresh water supplies up in the watershed that are providing for nature up in that watershed, but are also have a dual purpose of, of helping those cities with their fresh water. Um, we're working with coastal resilience, doing a lot of things like oyster reef restoration down in the Gulf, or wetland restoration around New Jersey and New York, because those things provide for biodiversity there, but they also provide some protection for the urban infrastructure from storms and sea level rise. We're working with cities and how they manage their storm water, again, because there's often problems, links between negative impacts from that runoff from the cities to the aquatic or to the water systems we care about, the lakes, the rivers, the oceans. And we also are working with youth in these various cities to really build a conservation coalition and conservation professionals and a, and a, and a thoughtfulness of conservation and the role that nature provides in society that can build upon that and work for the future. So I want to give you a couple examples. And the, I'm going to take you, again, as I said at the beginning, around the world. I want to give you an example from Africa. 
and I'm going to bring you back to Detroit. And the example I'm going to give you from Africa, this doesn't look too much like many African places that we think about. There's probably a few cities in Africa that do look like this. Um, but I want to show you an example of what we call a water fund. And a water fund is a very simple concept that cities rely upon clean water from their upper reaches, from the watersheds, from the lakes and rivers that feed into them. Oftentimes, however, much of the habitat is degraded in those watersheds, forest practices, maybe adverse agricultural practices. And the cities then suffer from that. They don't get enough water, their water might have a lot of sediment in it, there might be, might be polluted. So what we've done is innovate a system where the users in the city can actually pay for conservation up in the watershed that then has a virtuous cycle back and allows them to have clean water. So the city users are paying for conservation practices up in the watershed that benefit biodiversity up in the watershed and then have a benefit back to the city in terms of less money they have to, might have to spend on treatment or less money they might have to spend on their supply. And so I'm going to take you over to Nairobi, and I, I'm going to take you over there because we also have a program on global Great Lakes, and I got to visit the Great Lakes of Africa last year, and, and I'm going to go again this year. And it's a fascinating place, and many of these Great Lakes in Africa have many of the same issues that our Great Lakes in North America do. So there's a natural exchange of information. Um, but we have done water fence, all these blue dots throughout South America and North America, we have this experience, again, of paying for conservation practices up in the watershed that provide then clean water back to the city and provide for nature up in that watershed. And then recently, we've expanded this to bring it over to Nairobi. Um, this is Mount Kenya up here, Kenya National Park. Nairobi's down here. This is the watershed of the Tana River that comes down here, a major reservoir here. Now, even though the city of Nairobi is outside of this watershed, they have supply pipes, just like we do out west, that move, sit, move water from this watershed into the city. And there's also many agricultural land users out here, people that do grazing and agriculture all throughout here, and there's incredible biodiversity routes throughout here that rely upon water. So just to give you a little spoke, this is in Kenya. Um, Nairobi's down here in the, in the left corner, it's in the Kenya. Uh, Tanzania's just to the south here. Now, Many in the city of Nairobi use these, uh, they're called jerry cans, and they really can get water only a couple days a week. And so they get their water from their, their faucets or, or from a public source, store them in the jerry cans, and use those jerry cans throughout the week. Um, however, in Nairobi, um, people oftentimes have to travel to get their water, so people spend time to go get their water from a public resource. And there's also the factor that there's, there's kind of a, a short wet season and a longer wet season and then real dry seasons in between. So the, the, the source, the quantity of water is not consistent throughout the year. So sometimes it's easy to get water, sometimes it's a little bit harder to get water. And sometimes you have to go further to get water. If you're spending your time getting water, it means you're spending less time doing things like working or educating your kids or doing other opportunity or doing other work around the house or as a business. Now, um, the Tana River is Kenya's largest river. Um, and the city of Nairobi, or the, the Tana River provides 50% of Kenya's energy, 95% of the drinking water, and nine million, for nine million people. Okay, just from a societal perspective, that's a pretty darn important river, we would say. <laughs> um, but it's also a globally, incredibly wetland, has um, in, in many endangered species, Columbus monkeys, incredible wetlands there. Um, so the biodiversity, it's on the um, Mount Kenya National Park. The biodiversity resources are also out of this world. So incredible biodiversity, but heavy, heavy people reliance are, are depending upon this river. And there are problems that this river is full of sediments. This uh, woman is a farmer, and you know she can't grow food without the soil. And many times, because of the rains, because of the historical land use, that so the rains come in and the soil's washing onto the river, and it impacts her livelihood as a producer up in those watersheds. There's 300,000 small farms throughout this landscape. So we've introduced this water fund to kind of protect, find a source of funding to protect forests and riverbanks transform the way people are using water in the agricultural and urban landscapes and inspire investors in that urban setting to invest in conservation to protect their water resource. 
So this is an urban conservation. So we have two purposes, conserve the soil water and soil and make our water better. So there we're working with farmers up in the landscape on water storage, on efficiencies in irrigation on their lands, and all those kinds of things. So they actually can get the same bang for their buck, or they can get a greater bang, more bang from using less water when they can use it a little bit more sustainably. And at the same time, Coca-Cola is in Nairobi, and the river is one of their major sources for their products. And so they have, are one investor in the conservation practices because it makes their water supply a little bit more sustainable. So we've linked a major industry here, investments in conservation that have all the conservation benefits up there and have the water benefits to the city. And what I love about the Nature Conservancy, we monitor this, we monitor the health of the water, we monitor um, how the households are doing, are they getting enough water, we monitor the security of the water and that food supply. And so by 2025, in about 10 years, we hope to see a 30% drop in the interruptions caused by sediment spikes. So again, if there's a storm, there's a lot of sediment in the river, people can't use that water because it's, it's not filtered. Uh, we hope to see 18% less, 18 less sediment in that major reservoir that I talked about, and 50% more water in the dry seasons. And again, I mentioned there's a wet season and the dry season. If you do more to conservation, there is more water flowing during that dry season. And a 30% increase in the farm income. Some nature benefits, See, over 10,000 hectares restored, along riparian areas, greater resilience to changing temperatures and heat stress due to climate, um, and over two million trees planted. And what's neat is in the city, we have seven key industry partners are contributing to this. Um, the Water Fund has been declared a national priority in the city of Nairobi and nationally a priority. Over 13,000 farmers directly involved, um, oops, I lost us. And um, over 100,000 acres under sustainable management. So my point is here is that this is an urban conservation set of work. We have engaged urban users, corporate users, industrial users in the city in conservation up in the watershed that benefits the species, the habitats, as well as the farmers and the producers up in that watershed, and then has a returning benefit back to the city in terms of more reliable water and healthier and cleaner water. And so it's kind of this, this positive feedback loop, this virtuous cycle where the investment here gets more nature up there, more nature up there, gets more supply of the resources here, and, and even hopefully furthers the investments back in nature. I lost my point. Excuse me for a second. So now I want to bring you back um, to North America and to our backyard. And I want to talk about um, our work in Detroit. Uh, we officially launched a program and a staff person in Detroit about a year ago after many, many years of, of talking to dozens and dozens of partners in the city to understand what potential role the Nature Conservancy could play in, in helping out Detroit ensuring Detroit has, has, has clean water, ensuring that habitat is there for some of these processes I talked about, but also making the link back to the health of the city and the people and the communities of the city. So I'll go back to my schematic here and I wanna talk about why do we do nature in the city of Detroit that benefits the city, but also has benefits downstream of the city. So let me give you a little bit of background and then I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in the city. Um, and this is a, a nice shot of Detroit on a, it looks like a little bit warmer day, maybe in the springtime. Um, I first want to make the argument that Detroit is full of nature. Um, that's a picture I took on Belle Isle, I think this winter. Yeah, it was just, it was maybe in December. I was down and, and I have this habit of having a meeting in, in, in the morning somewhere in Detroit and I'll bring with my lunch with me and I'll drive out to Belle Isle and sit there and eat my lunch and kind of watch the river or watch the ice go. If you haven't really been out there lately, go out there. It is, it is a beautiful and fascinating place. But this is a, this is a tundra swan um, and, and a bird that migrates from way up in the northern parts of Canada down to Chesapeake Bay and they kind of move through this area, right? Because you think Detroit's kind of right in the middle of that migration. So this is a, a, a swan that's really a treat to see. Now also in the Detroit River, um, that, that northernmost uh, red um, star there upstream Belle Isle, this is a lake sturgeon. Wonderful, wonderful, um, crazy looking primitive fish. 
Uh, lake sturgeon can get, get six feet long, um, but it's an endangered species in, in, in areas of the Great Lakes. And there's been a reef restoration and it's on the rocks there, and that's where it spawns. It lays its eggs, it gets down in the rocks, and they need these kind of rocky reefs. So there's been a restoration up there. So you can go in the water and see things. Um, so you have these globally incredibly important bird migrations. So this is a map on the left of major migratory pathways of birds. And there's an Atlantic pathway, which is kind of in the red, and there's this kind of central pathway, which is in blue. And if you look in the Great Lakes, remember that map I showed you earlier where the birds all came together and all intersected? That's why, because there's two major pathways. There's birds that winter on the Atlantic coast and there's birds that winter down in South America. And they move right through this area. And they use areas like this. These are a couple shots from Chicago in the background. Um, they use areas like these that are in some type of native cover. Not, not, doesn't have to be trees, doesn't have to be forests. It can be shrubs or flowers or grasses, but that's what they use. This is a map from a, a data set that Cornell collects um, when birders go out and watch birds. They upload all their digital data and there are millions and millions of data points. And the dark reds are where the highest diversity of species. So the darkest reds you see are about 300 species that have been detected in those areas. Now that's some partly relation to the fact that there's more people there counting more birds than there are down in central Ohio or, or, or middle, middle Wisconsin. But it also just happens to be that is where more birds are. And those happen to be where you know, Chicago and Detroit and Toledo and Cleveland and Toronto are. Um, so again, thousands and thousands and millions of birds moving through these landscapes every single year. As you may remember, we also have a few problems. Um, a couple years ago, uh, aftermath of the August flooding, that was in 2014. 10 billion gallons of sewer overflows from Detroit in that flooding event. So that's sewage that goes directly into our waterways because we have a combined sewer um, wastewater treatment system. So when the system gets overwhelmed, it just overflows directly into the waterways. 10 billion gallons, that sounds like a lot to me. And not just that, there was $1 billion in damage. So it wreaked havoc on much of Metro Detroit, five inches of rapid rainfall um, drenched the freeways, the streets, and the homes, you know, basements, vehicles, roadways, other infrastructure, time lost to trucking and to moving goods around. So a billion dollars worth of damage because we couldn't handle, that's a major rainfall, I'm not saying we can't handle that with nature, but partly because we couldn't handle that, that kind of damage, ecological damage and, and social economic damage occurred. Um, a little bit of science and some, some, some conceptual ideas. Um, we also heard about the western basin of Lake Erie that suffered from some harmful algal blooms. And the city of Toledo had to shut down their water intake uh, valves a couple years ago that impacted you know, half a million people for a few days. The main source of that problem in the western basin comes from the Maumee River and a combination of mostly agricultural practices but some urban issues in that water basin. Um, the Detroit River there in, in the orange is also a major source of phosphorus to the system. Now some of that's coming from up above Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair, but some of that is also coming from the city of Detroit. Now the Detroit River doesn't contribute to our best scientific knowledge right now. It does not contribute that much to the harmful algal bloom problems. Um, so again, this is a good map because you see the green, which is the algal blooms, and you see how it comes out of plume out of the Maumee. Now if you look at the Detroit River, even though you see a little green up there in Lake St. Clair, it's a little more blue right at the mouth of the Detroit River there, right? And there's so much flow coming down there, and the flow of the Maumee comes in, so you have the phosphorus coming in from the Maumee and the phosphorus coming in from the Detroit, and it kind of converges and then kind of bounces off each other in general. And so most of the water coming down the Detroit Ru River bounces off the water coming out of the Maumee and goes into the central basin of Lake Erie. So that's the part past the islands over in here. This is the central basin, so the western basin, you have the islands right here and the central basin. So the, the water coming from the Detroit River and partially the problems come from Detroit aren't so much a harmful algal bloom problem, but they are a hypoxia problem in the central basin. So hypoxia is a lack of oxygen deep in the water. And so you run out of oxygen deep in the water. You don't have oxygen for the animals, the species that live there, the perch, the walleye that people like to catch, <laughs> and all the other species that make this its home. So the Detroit River and part of the problem from that all that sewer overflow from Detroit is not so much a harmful algal bloom problem to the best of our knowledge at this point, 
but it does contribute heavily to a hypoxia problem out in the middle of the lake, which causes a dead zone out in the middle of the lake. There's a few other things about the city of Detroit that are somewhat troubling. This is a heat vulnerability index that's based upon lots of different things. Um, land cover, land use, socioeconomic status, age of, of the community. Um, but what this shows is that different parts of the city, the darker area, are more vulnerable to changing climates and extreme heat events. This is a map of vacant lots in the city of Detroit where the red is heavy vacancy between almost 75 to 100% vacancy where the red is. So I'm showing you a bunch of different things, right? I showed you an interruption of bird migration. I showed you a water quality problem. I showed you a potential climate change issue and, and a social and a health issue. And I'm showing you with some land vacancy. Um, I had another map that I don't think I put in, or maybe I have later. Um, Detroit is a big city. Manhattan can fit in Detroit, plus San Francisco, plus the city of Boston. All three of those land masses fit within here. And that together, that's about 3 million people from those cities that would fit into here. This is a city built for 2 million that has about 700,000 people. There's a lot of land here. And so the question gets to be is how do you use that abundance of land and the fact that that has changed over time to help the city with natural solutions? So just a little picture. This is in Detroit. This is a low vacancy area. So it's, many of the houses are still occupied. A medium vacancy, you see some empty lots where there were houses that maybe were, were, um, were uh, demolished and, and returned to just an empty lot. And this is a high vacancy area where there were many houses. So again, that's how the city has changed over the past decades. So the question gets to be is how do you redevelop this land? How do you do it in a way that's, that uses nature to um, promote things like the biodiversity and the migratory bird habitat? in a way that can manage storm water. So how do we use what we call green infrastructure in the middle here to provide all these benefits to the city? And the blue are the goals that we hope to provide for people and society. Increased property values, neighborhood revitalization, quality of life, human health things through cleaner air, workforce development to work and maintain green infrastructure. I talked about some goals for nature down there in the green on the bottom left mainly water quality goals of the water leaving the rivers and leave, leaving the areas like on the Rouge River and the, and the Detroit River about down, to the, down to the Lake Erie um, and healthy habitat both for species that live here, those fishes, but as well as the birds migrating through. But we also have goals for the city and the operations of the city. How do you have long-term financial sustainability and how can you maintain the programs that can provide the green infrastructure that provides those. So we hopefully here, I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we're doing to try to hit on all these things. Um, because we really do see green infrastructure as, as really a, a central point um, that unites all these different issues, can provide for nature and can provide for people, as I discussed earlier. So what is green infrastructure? <laughs> um, and so you can think of green infrastructure as lots of different things. Maybe it's, it's a big park. Maybe it's a 100-acre park that has been um, planted or designed or purchased or owned or managed slightly different. Uh, the Green of Detroit is a wonderful organization. If you like it down and volunteer with an organization, they do incredible work in the city of Detroit doing all different kinds of tree plantings. Trees, when you have good trees, um, that are mature trees, they can soak up lots of water, they use a lot of water, they provide shade, they moderate climate, um, they add to property values, they clean the air, trees are a good thing, a good natural thing. So that is green infrastructure. Maybe on small lots, maybe on tree sides, but maybe on larger parks, 100 acre, 200 acre areas. In Detroit, we have, there's a lot of vacant lots, and so a lot of times abandoned structures are demolished, and you can green those vacant lots, you can put some type of um, this is just the beginning stages up there, but you can put some structures down in the ground and that guide stormwater into, filters through those structures. There's some work at the University of Michigan where they'll leave the basement in some of these houses and actually fill that in, and that's a filtration system, and they'll take the street water and guide it to there, and it goes through that filtration system back into the groundwater. Some really neat work there in monitoring the quality of those. Um, you might also provide those, some of those in natural plantings and again, guide the stormwater to those things. That's also green infrastructure. There's also simple practices like disconnecting drain spouts. 
So down there on the bottom left, many times our drain spouts go directly into the sewer. They come down the drain spout of your house, are directly connected to the sewer, go into the sewer system, and so all that rainfall then gets directly contributed to the sewer system. You can simply build a rain garden, things like that, disconnect those, and then that water goes back out and can infiltrate into the ground in some of these green infrastructure. Those things count too. So again, I didn't show you a picture of the big park type installations that have been done in all kinds of cities around, around the country. And I showed you a couple of simple things that are being done within the city of Detroit. So again, this is a vacant, another view of a vacant land. And, and so the question is, how do you think about how this is going to be developed in the next 20, 50, 100 years? Um, how can you do that? that's gonna promote development and promote um, people moving to the city and promote the, a vibrant city, but how can you also do it in a way that's gonna be able to handle the stormwater events that can provide habitat, that can use that green to um, build the community? Um, I was just talking to one of our senior scientists, our, our organizational senior scientists, and they, she's just done some work with partners that show, this is very correlative and suggestive, but they showed that um, they used um, some of our national testing, our school testing in, in grade schools, some of the common core testing and standardized testing, and we're able to correlate how much nature there is in and around these schools with test scores. And test scores are higher, controlling for all other kinds of things, socioeconomic status, location, um, you know, all those other things. Test scores tended to be higher in areas where there is more nature. <laughs> Students have a view of nature, they have a view of trees, they have the view of the outdoors. It's very suggestive, but it's enough to, to dig a little deeper and look at that relationship. So nature can provide many, many benefits. So how do we redevelop a city um, thinking about the value that nature can provide? So this is gonna get a little geeky and a little strategic, but this is somehow time, how we think behind the scenes. Um, in Detroit, we have four major strategies. We, we wanna do the, the work that's a bit behind the scenes, that's not our traditional nature conservancy work. Um, we're working with the city to review some policies and practices that are city policy and practices, and we want to develop those policies in a way that incentivizes green infrastructure. So I'll give you one example. Um, you go down, when you go down the city of Detroit, you might park it in one of these big surface lots. Um, they don't get charged a, a water bill because they don't use the sewer, but they do contribute to runoff. So because they don't have a water use, they never get a bill, but they contribute to the use of, of the infrastructure that promotes. Um, so there's review of that type of policy to try to do it in a way that would incentivize those, those people like parking lot owners or some large businesses to install some green infrastructure. So maybe they can, don't, they can avoid getting charged if they can install some green infrastructure that can manage some of that water instead of having that go into the sewer system. Not very sexy work, um, but very groundbreaking work. Not particularly visible work, but essential work to incentivize people investing in green infrastructure. Um, number two there, where it says aligning across the city partner and stakeholders. This is where we do things like develop the science of how much green infrastructure, where do we want to put it, what types do we want to put, and have a common vision among stakeholders. Also doing things, I mentioned working with the Greening of Detroit to build a workforce that is skilled in maintenance, installation and maintenance and the care of green infrastructure over the long term. Because if we want to advance that, incentivize it, we need people to manage it, take care of it, install it with the technical knowledge and know how, how to do that. Um, we do not at this point in time have any green infrastructure projects that have a Nature Conservancy sign on them and I'm not sure we will, but we are hoping to aggregate amongst partners and find different ways of financing green infrastructure. The city doesn't have a whole lot of money. We can't necessarily look to federal grants to, to pay for all this. We can't look to private investors or philanthropic ways to pay for all this, but we probably can look for some combination of those types of things. So we have a group within the Nature Conservancy now, um, almost an investment wing, that tries to think of ways to find sustainable financing for these green infrastructure installations. So again, this is kind of a boring slide and I apologize because this is the policy and practice and legislation slide. So we're working on three things, a drainage charge, a post-construction stormwater ordinance. So this is interesting. We're working in the city of Washington, D.C. 
um, where they don't have the luxury of land that we have here. And so they have an ordinance in the city that developers have to be able to manage much of the stormwater because they have problems with their waterways around, it, around the city of Washington. They have developed a post-construction stormwater ordinance. So the developers are incentivized to, to be able to manage some of the stormwater on site. And the, what they can't do, they have to invest in green infrastructure off site that will. So there's a, there's a flow of money there and now an investment that actually can get some green infrastructure done in important areas that are off site of those developments um, that's funded by the developers. And again, there's a net benefit to the city because the management of that stormwater is a lot easier. And we're also working with the uh, Detroit Water and Sewer on a permit they have because they have to be able to manage some of these um, combined sewer overflows that I'll talk and I'm not going to go into any detail there. I want to give you an example of how we're working with greening in Detroit. Again, even if green infrastructure hits just a small fraction of these abandoned lands, there has to be a workforce um, that is devoted. And we, as Nature Conservancy, are very um, invested in making sure we talk about native plants in these developments and native plants in the green infrastructure. So we're working, uh, we have a grant right now, we're working with Green in Detroit to develop training protocols for professionals, um, give them opportunities, develop a curriculum with them, and as green infrastructure comes online, link them with the management and maintenance of that. I'm gonna jump over that one. So I've given you two examples, one global, in Nairobi, which might not seem like it's our backyard, but one that is our backyard in different ways and reasons that we protect nature. And I really want to point out, it's not solely for nature and it's not solely for people, but in the conservation world right now, trying to figure out that interaction between what benefits nature and can we provide win-wins that also benefit people are very important given all that background and the changing landscape we work on. Um, just a couple other stats. 70% of the global population will be living in cities in 2050. That's not a reason to do conservation in cities, but it's a driving factor behind it. 80% of the world's resources will be used by cities. So again, that's not a reason to do conservation in cities. I can do lots of conservation without caring about that statistic. But it does provide an incentive in maybe making conservation a little bit more relevant to society. That last one, $5 trillion globally, $5 trillion per year is needed to provide the infrastructure for the, that type of population growth in cities. Okay, if I could just take a fraction of $5 trillion per year and instead of investing it in pipes and, 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 and human-made infrastructure and invest some of that in green infrastructure, imagine the nature benefits we could get. So again, these aren't reasons to do conservation in cities but their incentives to do conservation in the cities and their incentives to make conservation relevant to a majority of the world's population. That's the last slide I have. Um, so thank you very much. I hope I, 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 I taught you a little bit about nature and cities and the reasons why we're doing conservation in cities. Um, please feel free to connect us. We have many wonderful events coming up. As, as we mentioned at the beginning, there's two more talks here at Cranbrook. If you go to our website, at nature.org Michigan, you can find other opportunities. We have a wonderful spring field trip for, for kids um, just a little bit southwest of Ann Arbor at one of our preserves and a couple other local talks, conservation cafes, which are lunchtime talks. So thank you very much. I don't think I have a slide after, oh, it's just the city of Detroit, just the city of Detroit. Um, but thank you very much and I have some time for questions. Yes, ma'am. You haven't mentioned oh. compensatory wetlands. It turns out that there's one in Dearborn that bothers me very much. Yeah. It hasn't worked at all. It hasn't. Um, so there's there's a idea out there about wetland mitigation or compensatory wetlands. So if a developer does damage to a wetland, they oftentimes have to pay into a mitigation fund and they do mitigation either constructed or wetland in another place. Um, in many past decades, um, it hasn't been done very well by design. And so a lot of times they'll build wetlands, I mean you can pass them as you're driving north here, and they're kind of maybe out in the middle of the farm field, or out in the middle of somewhere, they're not well connected to waterways, the ground, they're not monitored over time, sometimes they're just homes for a bunch of invasive species, they're not managed pretty well. What's really interesting is right now, um, 
the state of Michigan is rewriting some of those wetland mitigation rules about where they can place those and how they can place those. So in the past, it's oftentimes, if you were putting in a big box store here, you found the nearest place and made a wetland there. Um, they're gonna change that and allow a little more flexibility. So if you're building a big box, you might be able to place your mitigation anywhere in the watershed, as long as it makes a little more ecological sense. And so there's, it's, it's neat because they're rewriting some of those rules and regulations and trying to make them a little bit more um, ecologically sound and make sure that, so it's, it's a neat time with that. And we're actually um, working with the state to rewrite those and we are hopefully gonna be able to f design and guide the way that some of those investments get made in the future that make a little more sense. Yes, ma'am, right behind. Yeah. Um, again, it's been a, it's been an incredible learning journey for me over the past about three years. We've had these conversations. Um, I don't think we've run into anybody that doesn't see the value of green infrastructure, and the city does see the value. And we've had wonderful conversations with the city. The city is oftentimes also faced with some very immediate other management concerns, like concerns, <laughs> keeping out the lights, safety, and other things. But in our conversations, um, all the various, there's many, many departments of which green infrastructure can have a benefit. And we're starting to see conversations across ways. And we're trying, starting to see conversations where people see, oh yeah, there is a link to community revitalization. There is a link to stability. There's a link to health. Um, and there are oftentimes that they do have a consent decree on some of these places where they have to test out green infrastructure installations. So in terms of the, the city government, I, it's very promising. Um, I've been very impressed. Um, but there's wonderful NGOs out there. I mean, there's places like um, Recovery Park and, and Eastside um, Market that are also talking about how they're gonna develop their land in ways um, that, are, that are using those lands and can manage storm water and make it a little more sustainable. Green in Detroit is a wonderful organization. Um, you know, Sierra Club is engaged. Um, um, I'm missing a couple of those. Um, yeah, entrepreneurs, some of the developers. I, 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 I'm, I'm very impressed. Yeah. Was there another question up here? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is the Conservancy International Organization, yeah, we are a global organization. We're the world's largest conservation organization. We're active in all states in about 30 to 35 countries. Um, we did launch an Africa program. It's only been around under a decade, but that program has is, is grown incredibly. Um, not all of Africa, but we have, we have I don't know, probably about a dozen selected places where we're active in Africa. Um, I did have, uh, I do get to work on a project that's kind of linking our Great Lakes resources to the African Great Lakes, like Tanganyika and Malawi um, and Lake Victoria there, which most of the world's water is there. <laughs> yeah, so we're active around, around the globe. And so what's neat is the process and the methodology and the science behind those conservation. I can go anywhere in the world and we follow the same kind of st strategy development and methodology, so it's fascinating because the knowledge can be very transferable. Yes, ma'am. Does permeable pavement fit into your green infrastructure? Yeah, so uh, the question is permeable, pave, permeable pavement fit into green infrastructure. Yeah, that is a means. So in terms of permeable pavement, instead of the water hitting pavement and moving off that in the sewer, it can penetrate and permeate into the groundwater. And basically what you want to get is nature to absorb a little bit more water. And you also want to slow the water down as it infiltrates. So a lot of our problem is how much water is hitting the system and how fast the water is hitting the system. If we can reduce the amount and slow it down a little bit, we'll be a whole lot better. And I also just want to make the analogy, this isn't different from the work we do in agriculture. We'll have major rain events, it hits all those drains and flushes out as quick as it can. We need to slow everything down a little bit and relax a little bit. And if we just slow the water down and keep the amounts in the water, or keep the amount of water about the same, we can have all kinds of conservation benefits. Yeah, yeah, so the incentive would be 
whatever, if they can document, so again, if this much water hits your property and that's all going into the sewage system, there should be a charge for that. If this much water hits your property and you can take a fraction of that and have some type of green infrastructure, whether it's permeable pavements or any things like that or any of these bioswales, and, and take that much out of the sewer system, your charge should be reduced by that and maybe even a little bit more. So you can take your reduction. So whatever you can manage with green infrastructure, using all different kinds of techniques and tools, whatever you can manage and keep out of the sewer system, that should reduce your charge. So that's the incentive you get. You're, you'd see a reduction in your bill. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I do not see any of these discussions f focusing really on, on remediation or penalties for past damages. So I don't see that. I mean, there are other mechanisms that there's environmental damage assessments done on, you know, if there's a spill or something like that. Um, and there in the past have been some of those settlements that still produce income for some type of mitigation, but not in these strategies I was talking about. Yeah. Yes? You talked earlier about kind of all watershed. Mm -hmm. How are you guys defining the Detroit City or your Detroit scope? <laughs> That's a little different. <laughs> um, we're mainly focused on the city proper, so more the political boundaries, and not necessarily the ecological or the water boundaries. Obviously, it's a highly altered system um, with drainage pipes that are very, very old and interconnected and intertwined and intermanaged. Um, so mainly you think about, in urban systems, you generally think about sewer sheds. Um, but in this case, we're really thinking about the political boundaries because oftentimes the policies and the rules and the regulations and all those things are done on a political unit. So that's really the relevant unit. Um, some certain strategies apply some places. So I mentioned a consent decree that overseeing um, some overflows from the sewer system that is based on a sewer shed that has a specific geography that is around, around um, um, the Rouge River. So there is a little bit of that, but, but mainly you start dealing with political geog the political boundaries. Yes? Uh, that's a little bit different issue. So some of the, some of the, um, the, the, the um, materials that come out of the production and, and the burning of coal and energy where they um, put some of the waste materials in and some of that moves. That's a slightly different issue and, and we're not particularly involved in the management of, of those pollutants. And so that doesn't necessarily fall under the types of things. Now again, not that that's not an issue, but that's just not our, that's not our. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does, but it's. Um, a lot of the, the toxins and pollutants just are not what we have expertise and there's many wonderful organizations that do focus on those issues. So it definitely it's an issue and it's a problem. It's not something that the Nature Conservancy works on. Is that your question or? Okay, yeah. No, we do. Yeah, oh yeah, there's many other, many of the other environmental organizations. I'm sorry. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely, yes. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I was just looking at the Great Lakes um, areas of concern. Mm -hmm. The Great Lakes Commission. Right. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, this. So I mean, the question is really: Is there? There's a, 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 some barriers to entry into doing some of these types of investments we're talking about. Um, they're expensive. You know, technology might be new and maybe a little unproven. It's a little foreign. It's not the normal operation of business. So the really the 
it's going to be very important to have proper incentives and you can use a regulatory framework to, to incentivize some of the behavior and installation. I think one other thing that we, Nature Conservancy and many others, are coming to realize is, is a lot of times we rely upon public funding streams and, and quite simply it's nowhere near enough um, to fund some of these types of things. So it's going to take the investments from the businesses from the corporations, from the individuals, from the foundations, and maybe some, some type of uh, philanthropic investments or, or, or some type of financial instrument where it generates a small amount of return. Um, it's gonna really take a, a community of investments and a whole portfolio of investments to really implement this work at the scale it needs to be implemented. Yeah, so the question is we also have a lot of areas of concern that oftentimes are, are um, legacies of some spills and toxics and many other, um, but there has been a, a, an authorization for some more money to be invested in the remediation of those. Yes, ma'am. If I can just follow or try to make sure, sure I'm following like some, a couple of things you had said. So when you talked about the, um, the Nature Conservancy and how we have to Mm -hmm. then, then they'll be able to see That'll be incentivized. Yep. Right? Yes. So what kind of time frame does that yeah. actually take to, um, to make the point? Yeah. I mean, it, that type of work has, so the question is, you have these policies <laughs> you have to pass and rewrite and these rules and regulations. You have to incentivize. You might have folks that are grandfathered in and all these things. So what's really a time frame? Um, I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, there has been experiences in other cities. Again, Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia have been very successful in incentivizing green infrastructure. You know, you know I think those policy changes can be made in, in you know, years and months measurements, but the behavior change is probably decadal behavior change before you really start seeing as well. The city of Milwaukee has done an incredible work with green infrastructure and managing stormwater, but that, you know, honestly, that's that's decades in the works, and it's personalities and 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 dedications that takes time. So again, this isn't a switch that we're going to see tomorrow. Um, it's going to take take time. Can I follow yeah, up? just go ahead. The Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know. Yes, yeah. yes sir. Yeah. There are two items that I was expecting you to talk about. Uh-oh. The Rouge River <laughs> right. Wetland Demonstration Act has, is the largest project in many cities. Mm -hmm. In Dearborn and Beverly Hills, is the largest construction project in the history of both cities. How effective have they been, and can you, do you work with the, the Rouge River Demonstration? Um, we have not worked with the Rouge River demonstration, so I really don't know enough about the effectiveness um, of that particular installation. Now, again, but that has been, the, the Rouge River has been a wildly successful project, so there are some researchers, and I'm going to forget the name, that have looked at the impacts and the recovery of the um, aquatic invertebrates, the insects, and the fisheries in the Rouge River, and those have bounced back, um, and you're seeing fish there you really weren't seeing. So there has been some benefits, but I can't really talk much more specifically. The Friends, especially the Friends of the Rouge and the mm -hmm. Friends of the Detroit River. Yep. Those are big deals, at yep. least to me. Yeah. Can you comment on how you work with them? Um, we, again, are not working with those particular partners just yet. Um, um, we have been deeply engaged with other kind of Friends of the River groups throughout the state, uh, Shiawassee and, and, and many others. Um, but what we're trying to promote is those types, those are very successful and very ingrained, but promoting those types of communities, those types of organizations, because that is really where the, the, the energy investment and where the passion comes from. So those, the work of those groups is incredible, incredibly important. So you're not working with them. We are not partnering with them at this point in time.
Yep. Yes, ma'am. Right. That wouldn't have a water bill because they do they do contribute to the right. the infrastructure use. Yeah. yeah. And are the fees for the? I mean, I haven't heard about it in a few years. I know the city of Detroit a few years ago sort of went back and looked at their books and said, hey, we forgot to assess all these runoff fees. Mm -hmm. That weren't getting bills, yeah. Bills yeah. Um, are they actually billing for that now? That like I don't know the, the internal details of how that's working. Um, um, but what I, I, the one comment I would make as you reassess or restructure things is there's changes for people. And some there might be a cost that wasn't there, and some there may cost might go down. So how that gets communicated and how that gets rolled out and whether it's community support for these ideas overall is a very, a very important thing to undertake. Yes, sir. You made that very interesting correlation between children's exposure to nature yeah. and you know, doing better on test scores. Yeah. Are there specific programs designed to engage children in nature, you know, particularly in the urban areas? Yeah. Um, there are there are dozens. <laughs> um, um, the Nature Conservancy does have a program where we are not doing it in Detroit, but in in uh, many cities across North America, we're working with certain um, environmental or schools have an environmental bent in some major cities on educational programs and engaging those youth there. We have a nature and youth program that actually made a. A, I'm going to forget which school. They just made a, a gift in the city of Detroit to one of the schools to do some some gardens, some school gardens. I forget what the name of that grant was. Um, um, and we actually, a couple years ago, were host to some high school students that were from New York City that, again, the Nature Conservancy promoted and bought them to different work in different states to try to understand and see all the different types of conservation work. Um, we have a, a good youth program, but there are many other organizations that do. Um, and again, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't name them now. But, uh, but yeah, and I think that there's multiple benefits they've shown. I mean, there's been studies of corporate culture, just having a view or having plants indoors increases productivity and, and morale and the employee workforce and the satisfaction of the job. So there's lots of benefits. Again, some of those are correlative, and we may need a little bit more detail, but those are excellent examples. Yes, ma'am. We are not involved. I don't. Oh no, we did not. That um, we were not engaged with that. Um, one of our board members is engaged with that, and he did make a comment that he was a board member of the Nature Conservancy. He was not speaking for the Nature Conservancy in that. So I think in that in that. Um, Newspaper article, he stated um, that he was a member, of the, or a board member of the Nature Conservancy. That was not a Nature Conservancy position, and we did not make a position so on that. What, what do you think? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we were talking about yeah. everything off, that. Um, oh, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I think, honestly, there are places where um, aquaculture can be cited that and managed in such a way that should pretty much minimize the impacts on, on, on the system. However, there are some very important places in Michigan where, where those decisions better be made with very care, especially um, with consideration of the flows of certain rivers, the ecological value of certain rivers. Um, I do think that, given some of the trends I showed you, the provisioning of aquaculture as a protein source is going to be incredibly important for society. Trying to figure out, again, our general approach with the Nature Conservancy is many times, whether it's aquaculture or energy, the issue gets to be the siting and the management, not the fact that it happens or doesn't happen. A lot of times we realize these things are going to happen. We're going to have different kinds of energy. We're going to have wind. We're going to have solar. It will happen, and we need it to happen. Um, so the question is where it's cited to minimize impacts and then maybe mitigate offsite if you do have some impact and then the operations of those things. So I think there's a role I would be very um, care
careful in figuring that out. And I would be very patient in, in figuring out and very detailed in studying of those. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so permeable concrete, uh, I wish I had our urban director, Valerie, Valerie Strasberg, here because she was actually involved in Ann Arbor in the installation of some permeable concrete. It works. How long has it been installed in Ann Arbor? Uh, I, I'd say less than, I don't know exactly, but in the decade, less than five, ten years. But the problem gets to be the maintenance of it and the proper maintenance of it and making sure that your road departments properly maintain it. And, and so there's a, a lot of times people get excited by a new technology and might implement it, but if they haven't done the workforce development and their workforce training, it really doesn't make any difference. Um, so I, I'm a bit skeptical of some of them if they are not properly maintained and treated, and especially if there's not the budget to maintain and treat them. You can't just get a grant and install something and not have the money for the long-term maintenance of that. I, I do understand that some people have to leave and we probably should, um, it's a little quarter after eight, I'm happy to stay and, and answer some more questions, um, but I, if you have to leave, please feel free. And again, thank you, I'll, be, I'll stay up here and be happy to answer more questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>